Hello, everyone. I'm your announcer, and welcome to Radio Comedy Theater, hosted by the Edmund Historical Society and Museum. In today's show, you will hear segments from actual radio shows that aired during the 1940s or 1950s. Each one features holiday food or cooking, and of course, none go quite smoothly. This topic was picked in celebration of two exhibits currently on display, the Back to the 1950s exhibit and the one we're performing in front of, What's Cooking Edmund? Reenacting these radio shows as they aired 70 or 80 years ago is an entertaining way to experience history. Not only will you hear how people celebrated the holidays back then, you'll hear about how they managed through moments in history, like World War II. Despite the changes over time, one thing that generations can relate to, the universal theme of food. So gather the family around the radio, or your modern equivalent, and prepare to laugh your way through holiday cooking disasters. First up, the Fibber McGee and Molly Show, which ran for over 20 years on the radio. This actual husband and wife team appeared on the weekly show sharing household banter, while various neighbors dropped by to chat. One regular visitor is Harlow Wilcox, who also had the job of sneaking in a commercial about Johnson's floor wax. In this show, Fibber has just rummaged through the attic and found his aunt's old recipe for fruitcake. He's excited to make it, but Molly is skeptical about her husband's cooking skills. Now listen, dearie. Making fruitcake is a very complicated business. If you must have one, let me bake it. Complicated, my clavicle. Millions of people are making fruit cakes, and I must be as smart as some of them. Well, now, don't confuse smartness with experience, sweetheart. A seagull isn't very smart, but he doesn't fly around over Death Valley. Well. I don't know what made me think of Death Valley unless it's going to be the condition of my kitchen when you get through cooking. Look, kiddo, I don't think you quite grasp the significance of this discovery. This fruitcake recipe I just found up in the attic is Aunt Sarah's own private, personal recipe. Don't that mean anything to you? Yes, it does. It means I should have burned it when she first gave it to you. Gee whiz, Molly, I've told you about Aunt Sarah's fruitcakes. She used to make them every year. Aunt Sarah's fruitcakes, everyone raved about them, but she wouldn't tell anyone how she made them. My goodness, Molly, this thing might be worth money. You're so right. I'd have given myself $10 if you'd never come across it. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start off conservative-like. Just make one cake at a time until I get the hang of the technique, see? Then I'll take orders from a few close personal friends, see, and let them sort of spread the word around. Then when orders start coming in from all over the nation around the first of the year or so, I'll have to build a few factories. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, just look at this recipe. Aunt Sarah's own handwriting. I think she wrote it with a quill pen. Off a nervous goose. Oh, I can read it now, don't worry. Oh, now, let me see you now. I need to get the flour and the fruit and... All the ingredients. Hand me the phone, will you? Here you are. <clears throat> Hello, operator. Give me the wistful vista of market. Hello, market. It's McGee. Send me over a pound of nutmeg, a pound of uh, candied cherries, a pound of walnuts, a citron, orange peel, lemon peel, shelled pecans, allspice, cinnamon. <laughs> Let me lay this fruitcake recipe out here and get started. What a cake I'm going to bake. Aunt Sarah's fruitcake was always a talk of the town, and I'm going to stick close to this recipe than bubble gum to a ballet slipper. Well, let me say goodbye to my nice, clean kitchen. Now, let's see. Chop the pecans, dice the cherries. Oh, hi, Mr. Wilcox. Hi, Molly. Hi, Pepper. Hiya, Waxy. Say, do you like fruitcake? Fruitcake? I love it, pal. Well, that's what he's making. 
Did you say fruitcake? Yes. Oh, fruitcake. Well, no, I never eat fruitcake. I thought you said plum pudding, pal. Natural mistake. The words are somewhat similar, except they sound different. I understand. They're very good to eat, and they do give the household a very festive look. Of course, nothing gives the household a festive look quite like Johnson's Polishing Logo. Yes, just apply the floor wax on your linoleum floors and they will shine, shine, shine. Just imagine what it will be like when your family comes around for the holiday meal. Perhaps the very meal where you will serve this fruitcake. Okay, Waxy, I don't have time for your commercial today. I've got to get busy cooking now. How many fruit cakes shall I put you down for? The large size or just the small ten pound size? I shall be out of town for Christmas. Yeah? Where are you going? I'll think of a place. So long! Goodbye, Mr. Wilcox. Psh, what a character. He does like fruit cake. He doesn't like fruit cake. Of course, he's obviously never tasted my Aunt Sarah's fruit cake. Now then. I've got all the fruit laid out here in the sink. The nuts are over there on the stove. The spiders are on the chair. Uh-oh. Trouble? I knew that grocery store would mess me up in some way. Doggone it! I distinctly ordered shelled pecans, and they sent me unshelled ones. Look at them. No shells on them at all. Well, that's right, dearie. Those are shelled. I thought shelled meant with the shells. Unshelled means with the shells on. Well, that's ridiculous. When you say coated, that means with the coat on, don't it? When you say a well-dressed woman is always gloved, don't that mean with gloves on? See, you take the word dress, for instance. Does that mean with or without? Do you mean people or poultry? Oh. <laughs> I see what you mean. Okay, I'll try the nuts this way. I'm sticking to this recipe. I'm not taking any chances. Hey, where's the flour? All down the front of you. How in the world did you do that? I sneezed. Had to measure out a whole new batch. Now you just sit there and relax, dearie, and stop running out to the kitchen. Your cake is just fine. That cake's got to come out of the oven in a few minutes. Boy, oh boy, wait till you see this work of art. Aunt Sarah's own private recipe. And I made it word for word. Oh, I'll have this town raving about this cake by the time they taste this one. Yes, it will be wonderful. I can't wait to see it come out of the oven. Any minute now. Oh, been working and slaving over a hot stove all day just to make a fruit cake like Aunt Sarah's. It's time oh. to take it out of the oven. Here's the oven, Mitt McGee. Oh, it's time. Oh, come on, time to unveil it. The most lovely gold brown taste tickling mouth watering fruit cake you ever feasted your eyes on. Well, hurry, go ahead and open the oven. I'm dying to see it. Oh, a fruit cake like Aunt Sarah used to make. Watch it now, it's hot. Oh, look at it. Oh, gee whiz, why, look at it. It looks awful, Molly. Oh, look at it. It's terrible. Oh, now. Well, it doesn't look very good. Uh, no, not at all. Oh, I'm sorry, dearie. It doesn't even smell very good, does it? Oh, it's thin as a pancake, all black looking. Oh, gee, Molly, I don't understand. What's the matter with me anyhow? I'm such a dunce, can't even follow a recipe. You did follow the recipe. Now it isn't your fault, you were so careful. Well, doggone it. Aunt Sarah's always made her, her fruitcake from this here recipe, every Christmas. I know, you said the whole family raved about it. Everybody in town used to talk about it. Everybody used to say, oh. Oh, my gosh. I just remember what they used to say. They used to say, Aunt Sarah makes the lousiest fruitcakes.
My Friend Irma was a popular radio show that eventually became a television show and comic book series. In the show, Jane and Irma are big city roommates who are trying to make ends meet. Jane is bright and dependable, while Irma is, let's just say, innocently scatterbrained. Irma has a Bronxy boyfriend named Al who is happy but unemployed as a swindler who comes up with weekly get-rich-quick schemes. Their neighbor, Maestro, is a Russian music teacher. In this scene, Irma tries her hand at cooking. My name's Jane Stacy, and I would like to recite a little poem inspired by my roommate. It goes like this. My name's Jane Stacy, and I'm very fond of my roommate, who used to be blonde. She's lovely and sweet and also so kind. In fact, I think she's the best you can find. There's just one thing missing. I'm afraid it's her mind. Oh, Jane, I wonder if my boyfriend Al loves me? He's been gone a week. Your boyfriend Al is nothing. I've said this so many times. That man means nothing but trouble. He's never done an honest day's work. Irma, you need to settle down with a nice man who can actually support you. You're right, and I love you for it. Jane, it's Al. Oh, hi, Al. Come on in. Al, where have you been all week? I've been working. You've been working? Where? At the Star Garage. Oh, Al, that's wonderful. Can I get you something to eat? I could, I could use something to eat. I'll be right back. Jane? I'm through with bumming around. Man's gonna settle down and, and have a home. A wife, some kids, medical expenses, anything you can write off. I wonder where Irma is with that food. I'll go see. Stretch out and make yourself comfortable, working man. <sighs> Jane, isn't it wonderful that Al is working? It's startling. <laughs> You know, he's talking about settling down, <gasps> marriage. Oh, Jane, my dreams are coming true. Just think maybe next year I'll have a baby. I think I'll have a boy. A boy? The way the prices are going at the beauty parlor, it, it'd be a smart move to have a boy. That's fascinating. But the man of your dreams is in the next room starving? Oh yes, help me with this tray. Hey, this looks pretty good. Here you are, Al, my darling. It's something I whipped up. Tomato surprise, I hope you like it. Oh, looks delicious. Like I was telling Jane, there's nothing like... Uh, <coughs> uh, uh. Al? What, what's the matter with you? Al, you're kind of pale. I've, I've got to go, Jane. Go? Ow, ow! Gee, why did he have to leave? He started talking about marriage. Maybe we're pressing him too much. Did you notice how pale he got? Irma, honey, do you mind if I finish this tomato surprise? Okay. What did you put in this? Oh, help! I've been poisoned! What? Irma Peterson, what did you put in this tomato surprise? I only put what the recipe called for. I got it from Better Homes and Gardens. Better Homes and Gardens. Irma, this would kill any rose bush that ever lived. You get the door. I'm going to go to the kitchen and see what you put in this. Irma, darling, what's new? Al was just here talking of marriage and suddenly he ran out. I think something might be wrong with the tomato surprise I made. Would you please taste it? I'd be glad to. Well, what do you think, Professor? Stand in back of me, Irma. Why? This thing must explode. 
Did, did I see it leave something out of it? Only the most important ingredient. What? Penicillin. Oh. Oh, do you think that's what made Al ran out? He ran out? <laughs> Wonderful. I can't even get up. Hi, Maestro. You didn't eat any of that tomato surprise, did you? Jane, darling, take that and throw it out the window before you are arrested for possessing dangerous weapons. Irma Peterson, do you know what you put in that recipe? Uh, the stuff in that little can marked celery seasoning. Celery seasoning? Oh, Irma, I've told you a million times that celery starts with a C. That was kerosene. What? So what have I been putting in this little lamp? I don't know, but every time you light it, I want to eat it. Oh, so that's what made Al run out. Roughly. Every time you enter the kitchen, Irma, you make it a torture chamber. Irma, dear, you've got to do something about your cooking. The way to a man's heart is food, but you make it a perilous journey. The Life of Riley radio show began during World War II. The blundering main character, Chester Riley, is a family man and aircraft riveter. His wife, Peg, and their two children endure his misguided schemes, which usually ends with him having to apologize by the end of each show. In this episode, Chester is excited to have a traditional Thanksgiving dinner. But... The family has other plans. Junior! Hey, Pop! Shush! Is your mother around? She's in bad room. Oh, good! <laughs> hey, what's in that big packet? <laughs> it's a Thanksgiving turkey! But you told Mom we couldn't afford one this year. I never said no such thing. There's always going to be turkey in the Riley house on Thanksgiving. I ain't so poor I can't afford a turkey for my family. I ain't a papa if the day ever comes when I can't go to the bank and take out $15.30. Pop, you took my picky bank. Shh, don't you wait. Well, it's empty. You only left one quarter. This is Thanksgiving, son. Give thanks I left you a quarter. But that was my money. Well, let me finish, son. You don't think I'd steal from you, do you? You weren't home, and I needed it fast, just alone. I left you an IOU, and what's more, to show you my appreciation, you won't have to eat the part of the turkey you usually eat. Ha <laughs> ha! Don't, uh, this year, I'm moving you up front. Well, okay if it's just alone. Sure. Junior! Shpluh! Hide the turkey in the icebox. I want to surprise your mother. Don't you tell her I got it. Okay, I won't tell. Junior, did someone come in? Yeah, it was Pop. Well, he was very quiet. What's he up to? Oh, uh, nothing? Yes, he is. I can tell by your face. Yeah, well, he's got a surprise for you. Now, don't tell I said so. A surprise? But I can't say what. Oh, he must have bought me that dress I showed him at the May Company store window. Well, I certainly hinted enough. I can't wait to try it on. But, Mom, you don't understand. Hello, dear. I have a surprise for you. I know, and you're a darling. Junior, you told her? No, he didn't. I guessed. Uh. And you're sweet. Oh, Peg, wait till you see it. It's just the right size, and you won't have to do a thing to it except stuff it. <laughs> and there's no one that can stuff it like you. Riley, that is no way to talk in front of Junior. Why? You seen a turkey before? What? Uh, how dare you talk to me like that? Who's talking about you? I'm talking about another turkey. The Tom turkey. The icebox. For Thanksgiving. Oh, you bought a turkey. Well, sure, that's the surprise. Aren't you excited? What do you think? <sighs> well, never mind. I should have known better. Gee, I thought you'd be glad I got a turkey. 
Oh, I am, dear. Well, have a great Thanksgiving, and this year there'll be plenty of turkey. We'll just carve it up four ways. You better make it three ways. Pop, I will be with the football team for Thanksgiving. Huh? You gotta spend Thanksgiving with your football buddies instead of your family? The pilgrims never acted this way. But, Pop, I thought we weren't going to have a Thanksgiving this year. I don't want to hear no excuses. If your family means so little to you, then you go to that football dinner. <laughs> I still got your sister. Riley, I'm afraid Babs isn't going to be here either. She's been invited to Helene's. Well, fine thing. Thanksgiving, your old kids can't wait to get out of the house. And after all I've like, done for you, <laughs> it's not every man who'll rob a bank to buy a turkey. Riley! Junior's bank. <sighs> well, Peg, it's uh, Thanksgiving Day. Have you noticed how quiet it is? Yes, dear. Has it been this quiet for weeks? <laughs> no, dear. Well, it does a man good to get the kids out of the house and get a little peace and quiet. Uh, all the excitement, kids running up and down the stairs all the time. Yes, dear. Well, my goodness, Peg, when your own kids don't want to stay home for Thanksgiving. Oh, Riley, they're growing up. They want to be with their friends besides. I've got the turkey in the ice box, and we'll eat it next week when Babs and Junior are both home. Peg? Yes, dear? Peg? I'm lonesome! <laughs> oh, yes, dear. My goodness, really cheer up. After all, you promised me Thanksgiving at the townhouse, remember? I know! I'll get my hat and my coat. Peter Peg! Everything's fine. It's just a, oh, I've been doing a lot of thinking. Would, would you mind very much if we didn't go out? I'd rather just eat here. But the turkey's not ready. There's no food to eat. Well, sure there is. Uh, it's a whole heap of hamburgers in the ice box. Hamburgers on Thanksgiving Day? Well, Peg, to tell you the truth, this doesn't feel much like Thanksgiving. Not like the Thanksgiving we used to know. You know what I mean, don't you? I think so. Thanksgiving. <laughs> Always been a special sort of day for me. Even when I was just a boy, more than just a holiday. It was a time when the whole family got together to have fun. We used to go out in the country to my grandmother's, and, and it was my whole family, my Uncle Rob and his wife and his eight children, and my Uncle Will and his wife and their ten children. <laughs> that must have been cozy. <laughs> oh, it was. We ate in shifts. My grandmother always swore we were feeding at the neighbor's kids. Oh, my. Yeah, we can't even get our two children to stay home, Beg. We're failures. Oh, Chester, don't be so hard on them. We mustn't forget, this is a, a new generation with new ideas and new sets of values. Times have changed. Yeah, I guess they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it don't make it right, Peg. Well, let's go into the kitchen. See what we can throw together. Aw, oh, you're an old sentimentalist, Chester. And I love you for it. Oh, I love you too. And hey, maybe if the kids get home early, we'll have time to go to the movies. How do you like that? Oh, not likely. Bob said not to expect her until after midnight. And Junior's football dinner doesn't start until 6. Uh, uh, oh. Junior, what are you doing here? Fixing the hamburger. What one? What happened to dinner? What dinner? At the training table with, with the football team. Oh, that dinner. Well? I don't know. I guess I just wasn't hungry. Not hungry? You? I'm going to call Dr. Simmons. Oh, no, not a mother peg, Junior. If you aren't hungry, why the hamburger? The three hamburgers. I guess I got hungry. Junior, if you don't feel good, just tell us. I feel fine, Mom. I didn't like the dinner, that's all. 
a bunch of goofs sitting around talking about football? What good is that? Since when do you not like to talk about football? Yeah, just a second. I, uh, I heard the door. It's me, Father. <sighs> what is she doing home? What on earth? We're in the kitchen, Babs. I'll be right in. Oh, dear. Something must have gone wrong. Why do you automatically decide that something is wrong? Maybe Helene decided not to have the party. Well, what's everyone doing in the kitchen? Well, hi, Junior. What are you doing here? Eating hamburgers. Want one? Okay. Now, hold on. We have something much more important to discuss here. More important than hamburgers? Do you feel all right, Bab? Sure, I feel fine. Why? You told your mother you wouldn't be home until after midnight. Oh, uh, well, I... Well, I wasn't going to, but I came up with the most awful headache. You said you felt just fine. Well, I mean, I do. I mean, except the headache, that is. Oh, Bab, you must have come home for a reason. Did something happen at Helene's? Why are you really here? Oh, Mother. I just, I, was, I guess I was just missing you is all. Oh, oh, Bab. It's Thanksgiving and I wanted to be with you all. Oh, I missed you too, Babs, when you too, Junior. Stop! <laughs> Women crying like you didn't just see each other this morning. What's the matter with you, Junior? <coughs> Nothing. I just feel like blowing my nose. <clears throat> well, give me that handkerchief when you're done with it, Junior. <clears throat> oh, well, let's sit down. Let's get comfortable. Just the four of us? <laughs> we don't even have to eat in shifts. Hamburgers. A fine thing to serve on Thanksgiving dinner. I'll take over, Junior. I'm doing fine, Mom. Da -da -da. Don't argue with a chef, Peg. Just sit down and relax. Four hamburgers coming up. Oh, it sounds wonderful. Now, hold on a minute. Before we dig into these juicy burgers, may I say something? Sure, Chester. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Haven't you kids here well? We might be eating hamburgers, but this has been the happiest Thanksgiving day of my entire life. Friends. We hope you're enjoying the Radio Comedy Theater so far. Coming up next, we have the zany adventure of two teenaged boys, a visit to the Betty Crocker kitchen, and a skit with some very famous comedy teams. But first, we invite you to visit the museum website at edmondhistory.org to learn about more programs being offered. And won't you consider making a financial donation to the museum? They've worked hard to continue, bringing you great history programming throughout the pandemic. And now, back to the show! I call this meeting of the student body to order. We need to talk about our class dance for Thanksgiving. We've only sold ten tickets. Agnes? <clears throat> I mean, uh, Madam Chairman. Homer, you have the floor. Fellow committee members. The reason we haven't sold tickets to tonight's Thanksgiving dance is because we haven't appealed to the school spirit of our class. We have to make them realize that Central is counting on them to get out there and dance. I say if they won't buy a ticket, they should get a detention. Madam Chairman. Henry. Every year we go to these Thanksgiving dances, and what happens? Well, what I'll tell you what, we dance. I'm glad you asked. I say we climax our dance tonight with a good old-fashioned turkey run. A turkey run? Yes! And just when everybody's getting good and bored dancing with each other, we turn a 25-pound turkey loose, and the one who catches him keeps him. Oh, no, Henry. If you think I'm going to run after a turkey in my new dress, you're crazy. Besides, we can't afford a 25-pound turkey. That's just it. I can get us a turkey for as little as $5. Five dollars? Do you know how much turkeys cost these days? I know, and there isn't a thing to worry about. Henry, have you got a turkey up your sleeve? My Uncle John gave us a live turkey, and Mother already has a turkey dressed and in the refrigerator. My father would practically give it to us. Okay, Henry. 
Okay. Psst. Hummer. Hummer. Did anyone notice that I wasn't in study hall? Henry, where have you been? Trying to find a turkey. Father gave our live turkey away to Mrs. Dixon. Oh, no. What about the turkey run? I know. But Father said Mrs. Dixon deserves to have a nice Thanksgiving dinner, too. Especially with all those children. Oh, no, this is terrible, Henry. Don't worry. I found a replacement. You did? Henry, you must have been out of your mind to buy a, a, a thing like that. <coughs> oh. Hush. You're upsetting Felix. Felix? He was born with a name like Felix Henry. How are you going to explain to the dance committee... They've got signs up all over the school about giving a turkey run. Homer, a, a duck was all he could get for five dollars. Besides, gee whiz, he, he's much cuter than a turkey. <laughs> Hi, ducky wucky. Sure right, Henry, he is cute. Sure, and besides, we're doing a favor to whoever wins him. Every year it's turkey, turkey, turkey. Don't you think they'll enjoy the novelty of eating a duck instead? Henry, be quiet. Do you think we should discuss a thing like that in in front of the duck? Oh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, Felix. Henry, even if the committee says it's okay to have a duck run, a duck doesn't run. It waddles. Homer, you're crazy. A duck runs as well as a turkey. Look, Homer, I'll, I'll put Felix down and show you. Back up, and I'll put him down. Uh, here, ducky, bucky, Henry. That's waddling if I ever saw it. Oh, no, I just heard the school bell. The halls are filling up with people. Oh, boy. Wait. Where did he go? Right over those lockers. Oh, no. Homer, help me look for him. But Henry, what about my next class? Homer! Where's your school spirit? Our class has five dollars tied up in that duck. Come on! Yeah, okay. Come on, Homer. The duck tracks go right around this corner. Oh, boy, look at them. Well, at least they're easy to follow. Did you find out how Felix got into art class in the first place? Well, the way I got it, Henry, they were painting this bowl of fruit, see? And the, the poor little fellow must have been hungry. Oh, he was? And what happened after that was really Mrs. Stewart's fault. If she hadn't have let out that scream, Felix wouldn't have even have flown into the paint jars. Oh, at least he could have picked out two jars of the same color. Look, red and blue tracks all over the place. Henry, look! Those tracks disappear right in the middle of the hall. Wait, the tracks just disappear. They can't. He can't have disappeared into thin air. That's it. He started to fly. Oh, there's only one thing to do. Go into the principal's office and ask if anyone has seen a duck. He has to be caught before he does damage. Hi, oh. Homer. Hi, Henry. Boy, the whole school is talking about our turkey run. They are? Sure, Homer. Say, where's Henry headed off to in such a hurry? Oh, he needs to go see Mr. Bradley uh, about a little problem. Oh, no. You should stop him. Henry, come back. I've never seen Principal Bradley so mad today. Some wise guy threw a bunch of feathers, and they're all over the place, and all different colors, too. Mr. Bradley threatened to expel the student who did it. Well, so long, I've got to get to my next class. Bye, Agnes. Oh, boy, Henry. You'd better find that duck before Mr. Bradley does. Come on, let's look for him. He's flown the coop. Gee whiz, I've never noticed that before. Noticed what? That eagle. They're on the statue of George Washington out in the front of the, the school. Oh, that's no eagle, Homer. That's him. That's our duck, Felix. Henry! He's changed. Where are all his clothes? Never mind that. Here, Ducky Wucky. Come down. Uncle, Uncle Homer. Say, maybe I could knock him down with one of my shoes. No. You might hit George Washington. Felix, 
You'd better come back here. Don't scare him. Oh, no, Felix, Felix, come back. I didn't mean it. Hey, Homer, come on over. I'm saving you a seat in the cafeteria. Hi, Agnes. Uh, I'm not sure I could take time to eat lunch. Have you seen Henry? No! Don't you even have time to hear about what happened in gym last period? Something happened in gym? Oh, sure! We were playing volleyball, see? And right in the middle, a bird tried to get in the game. Did he look anything like a duck? No! It was different colors. More like a parrot. <sighs> Hi, Agnes. Hi, Homer. Did you have any luck? No, Henry. Gee whiz. I almost had him. I trailed him to orchestra practice, and he flew right into Albert's tuba. Well, why didn't you grab him? I tried, but before I had a chance, Albert blew him out. Blew who out? No one, Agnes. No one. Well, I have to congratulate you on that great idea for our Thanksgiving dance. The tickets are selling like hotcakes. They are? Sure. Everyone's hoping to catch that turkey. I hope he's a fast one. The whole track team just bought tickets from me. Agnes, about that turkey. <coughs> Homer, did you hear that? What was that? Yes, Henry, where is he? There he goes, under the table. Get down there and grab him. Okay, Henry, here, okay. After him, somebody get that duck. <coughs> Wait, the hey. oh, oh, oh. I, I, I got him. Henry, let go of him. got off the phone with Agnes. It seems that the dance tonight has uh, sort of been postponed. Postponed? Yeah, Homer. It seems that the student body is so worn out and they're too tired to dance tonight. Mm, too tired? Yeah, from that duck run we had at school today. The committee has decided to postpone the turkey run until Christmas. Well... Maybe we'll find that duck by the time Christmas rolls around. Oh, maybe, Homer. Oh, uh, hold on, Homer. There's someone at the door. Hello? I am Mrs. Dixon. The reason I came over is to tell your father that I found the turkey he left tied to the porch for me today. Uh, oh, oh uh, that must be the turkey Uncle John gave us. Well, please tell your father that I don't need it anymore. My children found a lovely duck today and practically all plucked, too. Oh, poor Felix. And now we move from family comedy to a cooking show. When you hear Betty Crocker, a radio show is probably the last thing on your mind. But beginning in the 1920s, the on-air cooking school was a hit. Betty Crocker was voiced by a variety of actresses on different radio stations. In this episode, Betty Crocker talks about lemon pie and steak. Although, this show wasn't intended to be funny. It's easy to find humor in how different cooking circumstances were 75 years ago. The show began this way. Friends, General Mills Betty Crocker comes to you today with a delightful account of those women war brides. And of course, Betty Crocker has some helpful recipes, for there's no other group in America today who are having more hectic times than these young wives of our servicemen especially for these young homemakers. But these recipes are sure to be welcomed by homemakers of any age. So here she is, your Betty Crocker. Hello, 
everyone. I'm going to tell you a story today, a real story of modern wartime. The man in this story is a Marine named Tony, and the girl's name is Lois. It was after that fateful attack on Pearl Harbor and war began. Tony went through six months of grueling training. He elected to transfer to the Marine Corps, and then he earned Marine wings and became a second lieutenant. He began to ponder, as thousands of men do, whether to marry or not to marry. Lois was the girl who he'd taken to all the college dances, the girl whose letters had helped him a lot when he was in training. Oh, yes, there was the usual conversation among the families. Should young folks get married now or wait for the security of peacetime? But the young couple decided for themselves, as young people have done since the beginning of time. Lois went down to Miami, and there followed three blissful but hectic months. She wrote, We have a darling little cottage. Of course, I do have to walk two miles to get groceries, but I don't mind at all. Tony got his overseas notice. He fought in the jungles and went on 55 combat missions, with 253 combat hours to his credit and he joined the fathers who have never met their babies club. Then finally, the miracle he'd hoped for, he was sent back to the States. Lois was ready and eager to set up house near the base where Tony was stationed. We are now living in a Quonset hut, a half cylinder made out of prefabricated metal. But after being in the jungles, he loves being in a home of his own. He craves cooked meals which get cooked in anything I can find. I baked a cake in the refrigerator tray the other day, and he just loved it. He boasted about it to his fellow Marines and said I could cook anything. They asked if I could make a real lemon pie, and he admitted I could, the wretch, although he'd never seen or tasted one I'd made. There I was, scheduled to make a real honest lemon pie like Mama used to make for 15 men. And some were just back from the Pacific and hadn't tasted real lemon pie in months. Making a lemon pie for 15 guests is difficult in the best of conditions, but Lois faced a temperamental oven, no pie pan, no measuring cup or spoon, no flour sifter or grater or egg beater, and no sharp knife to cut the lemon with. So I think she had courage to even try, don't you? She didn't want to let Tony down. Here is her account of making the pie. I used a half pint cream bottle instead of a measuring cup, and then I just fluffed the flour with my hands instead of sifting it the way the recipe said. I used a long olive bottle for a rolling pin. Grating the lemon peel presented the biggest challenge. I had to scrape and pick the rind off the lemons using a paring knife that might have been sharp once. It took hours. Then I had to use frying pans for the pies. Fortunately, I had three, although one was so big that I had to leave the oven door open so the handle could stick out. But the pie crust really did bake beautifully in spite of all that. None of the other wives thought I could possibly do it. This bride didn't cross this country in a traveling wagon, nor pick wild berries. She didn't cook over an open fire, but I claim that the pioneering spirit of our great-grandmothers is just as apparent in war brides today, like Lois. Even though the conditions under which they live today are so very different, Lois was just as ingenious as the pioneer women who made lemon pie from vinegar. And can't you picture how proud Tony was to supply his troops with a homemade cooked pie they'd been longing for all those months? For today's recipe, I'm going to give you a kind of homey meal that every woman needs to know how to cook for her husband. When you think of preparing a meal that will go to a man's heart, you think of steak. For all men seem to love steaks. So I'm going to give you a recipe for a kind of steak you can make with the food supplies low as they are now during the war. We call it emergency steak, and it's just as tasty and tender and appetizing as any tenderloin or porterhouse. Serve it sizzling hot from the pan, attractively garnished with green parsley or a few red radishes for some color contrast. 
no one could ask for a more delicious dinner meat. Everyone who has tried emergency steak is crazy about it. Here's the recipe, perfected by our staff for six servings. A bride could make half the recipe. Mix together one pound of ground beef, one half cup of milk, one cup of weedy cereal, one teaspoon salt, one quarter teaspoon pepper, one tablespoon finely chopped onions if desired. Pat the meat into the shape of a T-bone steak, one inch thick on a pie pan and broil eight to 15 minutes according to whether you want it rare or well done. Don't you think that's a wonderful way to, don't you think that's a wonderful way to make one pound of meat serve six? It's also a way in which plentiful food like weedy cereal can be used to extend a less plentiful food like meat. George and Gracie Allen were a comedy duo starting in the late 1920s going all the way through the late 1950s when Gracie Allen's heart condition prevented her from performing live any longer. They were not only a comedy duo, they were married. This is Nora and I's third incarnation of performing a George and Gracie segment together. Without further ado, this is Gracie's Baby Turkey Eats a Wedding Ring. Well, it's Christmas morning as we look in at the Burns home, but that's not the subject of discussion between George and Gracie. It seems that George is going to be the best man at a friend's wedding, and he's telling Gracie all about it. It's, uh, it's Bob Webster who's getting married, Gracie. Bob Webster? Yeah, you remember the Webster boys. We, uh, we had them over for dinner one night. Oh, yes, Bob is the one who spilt the gravy on the tablecloth's brother. Yeah, that's him. Uh, well, Bob is finally getting to settle down and marry himself a wife. Well, wouldn't it be better if he married himself a single girl? Uh, yeah, that's him. Well, uh, yes, yeah, she, uh, she is single. Oh, oh, good. Uh, do I know her? I don't think so. Uh, it's Marion. Marion Webb. Marion, uh, Carol. Oh, I thought she was Marion Bob Webster. Who's Bob Marion? Marion Carol. He's Marion the same person? No, 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 no. Look, Gracie. He's oh, Mary oh th then who's he Marion? Marion Carol. Uh, well, George, for a best man, you certainly are mixed up. Uh, Gracie, this is uh, Marion spelled M-A-R-I-A-N. Now do you understand? Uh, well, of course I understand. I'm no dumbbell. Good. So the bride is Marion Carroll. All right. Now, who's the groom? Oh, nuts. Uh, oh, the groom's Marion. Oh, nuts. Ah, ah, ah. It's an Irish girl, huh? Yes. Miley or nuts. Well, anyway, this is the first time I've ever been a best man. Uh, how do you think I should dress? Oh, the usual way. First, put on your underwear. No, no, then... no, I don't mean that way. I mean, how should I dress at the wedding? Oh, I wouldn't. I dress here. All right, forget the whole thing. I'll go to a wedding in a tuxedo. Well, it's only a couple blocks away. Why don't you walk? Well, a tuxedo, Gracie, is that funny black suit that I wore when we got married. Oh, oh, you still got that suit? For well, sure. You must owe a lot of rent on it by now. About $30,000. <gasps> Really? Yeah, now I'm gonna borrow some studs, but first I better put this wedding ring where it'll be safe. Oh, oh, what a beautiful ring. It's set with diamonds and everything. Yeah, Bob was so nervous, he asked me to keep it. Oh, let me wear it until the wedding tomorrow. Oh, no, 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 you might lose it. Besides, uh, you've already got a wedding ring. Oh, but this one is so beautiful. Gracie, a wedding ring is just a symbol. Besides, uh, it doesn't matter if it's solid brass. 
Uh, well, I know, I love my ring, but this one is so exquisite. I won't lose it, I've never lost mine. Honey, this ring is a thousand dollars. Yours cost five dollars. No, George, no, my ring cost ten dollars. No, I paid five dollars for it. Are you sure? Certainly. Oh, well, then you forgot to give me my change. All right, speaking of change, let's change the subject. Uh, how's your Christmas dinner coming along, Gracie? Oh, just fine, George. I've made pumpkin pie, chestnut dressing, and, and see, I've got the oven turned to 350 degrees. That's perfect for browning a turkey. Mm, oh, that reminds me, I, I better look at it. Nah. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. You burnt the turkey? No, I forgot to get one. Oh, fine, and I'm so hungry I could eat the table leaves. Well, quick, put them in the oven. I was only kidding. Tracy, we got to have a turkey. But, George, the markets are all closed. How will I get one? We'll drive out to the country and then buy one from a farmer. Hey, that's a good idea. Sure. What do you want? A, a, a Tom Turkey? A Tom Turkey, Sam Turkey. Who cares what his name is? We're going to eat him, not hire him. Find those studs, George. I'll head for the country. Morning, ma'am. <laughs> well, see, it's a lovely ring you got on. Oh, this five old $5. Say, that's a lovely ring I've got there. I must have been so busy heading out the door, I put on Marion's ring. By accident. Well, here they are, ma'am. I got about 20 turkeys left. <laughs> I'm selling them for 60 cents a pound. Well, I guess I'll have to pay it. My husband insists on turkey, but it does seem high. Well, it costs money to feed an old gobbler. Oh, yes, especially when he insists on turkey. <laughs> well, you want me to pick one out for you? Oh, no, no, no. You might try to fool me. I'll pick them out myself. I'm an expert. I know all about turkeys from their manes to their with withers. Yeah, well, I can tell you're an expert. Well, all right. Uh, uh, see which one you want, then. Mmm. Oh, oh, I see one I don't want. That turkey nearest the fence, it's got flat feet. Yep, besides it's a duck. Well, I want a turkey. <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh, there's a cute little baby one. Yeah, he'll be a fine bird when he grows up. <laughs> He's milk fed. Oh, now there you go trying to fool me. That little turkey couldn't be milk-fed. He's too short to reach a cow's faucet. Mm. I'm sorry I tried to fool you. Well, I better pick out a turkey. Eeny, meeny, miny. <gasps> oh! Oh, my goodness! What's the matter? The wedding ring! It's gone! It must have slipped off my finger here in the turkey pen. Well, uh, I, I don't see nothing of it. Oh, if that ring's gone, my husband will murder me. It's a thousand-dollar wedding ring. Uh, I'll bet I know what happened. One of them turkeys took it. Well, well, quick, which one of them is planning to get married? Lady, I mean one of them turkeys swallowed it. Oh, oh, that's terrible. Oh, you see, the ring isn't mine. My husband had it for another woman. Were you Hollywood folks? Oh, quick, get it out of that turkey! Well, I don't know which one swallowed it. Oh, I'd wish it'd been my wedding ring. We'd know the turkey in a minute. He turned green. Oh, but you, you've got to get it well, I, out! I, no, I can't kill all them turkeys. It's too late to sell them. Oh, I don't want you to kill them. Just turn them inside out and shake them. Lady, the only way to find that ring is for you to buy these turkeys and then let me kill them. Oh, no, sir. I can't let 19 innocent turkeys die just because one of them is a thief. 
I'll take them home with me and find the guilty one somehow. Yeah, just as you say, ma'am. But how will I get all these turkeys to town? Oh, I'll truck them in. <gasps> well, that's a long way to dance, but then you look healthy. Here's my address. Put them on the back porch. Gracie, I'm home. Where are you? Huh. I guess she's out in the kitchen. Uh, hey, Gracie, I got the tuxedo studs. Oh, not here either. Maybe she's on the back porch. <laughs> Holy smoke. A mother's here for Christmas. No, it couldn't be a mother. She talks louder than that. Uh, I'll have another look. <laughs> Who? Who's out there? No one but us turkeys! Gracie! Come in the house. I want to talk to you. Now, what gives on here? There must be a dozen turkeys. A dozen turkeys out in the back porch. Oh, oh, no, don't exaggerate, dear. If there are only 20. Why in the world did you buy 20 turkeys? Uh, why? Yeah, why? Oh, well, uh, uh. Uh, you see, when I when I left the farm, I only had two turkeys, but they happen to be male and female, and, well, uh, you know turkeys. <laughs> That's rabbits. N no, they're turkeys. Look again. I mean, turkeys can't multiply like rabbits. Turkeys lay eggs. Oh, well, there's something that turkeys can't do, so, or rabbits can't do, actually, so they're even. Gracie, stop being silly. Now, why did you buy 20 turkeys? I'm going fishing. I have to run out and borrow some tackle. You're going fishing? Where? Well, if I told you, you thought I was crazy. I'll take a chance. Now, where are you going fishing? Inside the turkey? You're crazy. Well, okay. All right. You see, I told you. But Gracie. Goodbye, Gra dear. <laughs> Come in. Uh, are you the doctor? I want to take an x-ray. Very well. Uh, step behind the screen and remove your clothes, please. All right, doctor. But can I peek over the screen while you x-ray the patient? You're not the patient. Oh, no, no. He's outside. I found the one. At least, I think he's the one. Uh, I think he swallowed a ring. Oh, a baby. Yes, yes, he's only about two weeks old. Oh, is he in any pain? Oh, no, no, he's very lively. On the way here, he jumped out of the car and I chased him for a block. And he's only two weeks old? Uh -huh. But very agile. I finally caught him on top of the mailbox. <sighs> This promises to be a remarkable case. Uh, uh, how did he happen to swallow the ring? Well, the ring fell on the ground, and I think he was the one who ate it by mistake when he snapped at a grasshopper. You allow him to eat grasshoppers? What kind of a mother are you? Oh, I'm not his mother. He's an orphan. <gasps> I'm a bit confused. Uh, suppose you just bring the patient in. All right. Oh, oh, I hope you can x-ray through his feathers. The baby has feathers? Well, certainly. All turkeys do. The patient is a turkey. Madam, I am not a veterinarian. Well, who cares if you eat meat? Just x-ray the patient. I'll make a bargain with you. I'll x-ray your turkey if you'll donate your brain to medical science. Mm, all right, if you can't get Einstein. <laughs> Imagine you thinking the turkey was a baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess I should have realized that a two-week-old wouldn't snap at grasshoppers. <laughs> not. My brother Willie didn't start until he was a grown man. <laughs> oh, 
For this, I opened my office on a holiday. Well, come on, George. Blow some smoke in the turkey's face. It'll make him cough. Doc said it was the only way to get we could get the ring without, you know. This is silly. Well, try once more. A great big puff. <laughs> He didn't cough. I coughed. Well, why? You didn't swallow a ring. I swallowed some smoke. Oh, well, we don't need that. You can keep it. All right, I've heard enough of this. I want that ring, and it's just too bad, but it's turkey. I'm going to take the axe and let him have it. All right, George, but at least be humane about it. Let's do it in his sleep. It's three o'clock, Gracie. It's not exactly time to turn the porch light on. No, George, we'll lull it to sleep with a dreamy song. I'll sing it myself. Get a load of this. Silent night. Gracie, 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 look! The turkey! It's choking! He coughed up the wedding ring! Oh, how wonderful! Uh, I'll take it with me just to be safe. Well, I'm a success. Yes, dear. Anytime a turkey swallows a wedding ring, we'll call you from now on. If the name Mel Black sounds familiar, it's because Mel is the original voice of Bugs Bunny and many other Looney Tunes characters. But he got his start in radio, in the Mel Black Show, which ran only a year. He used his real voice and played himself as the owner of a fix-it shop. In this episode, he's hosting his girlfriend and her parents for holiday dinner. But one thing is missing. A turkey! Uh, uh, hi, 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 Betty. Oh, Mel, I thought you'd never get here with that turkey. Uh, uh, look, look I, I got cranberry sauce, uh, the chestnut stuffing, and, ooh, and then pumpkin pie. Oh, 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 that's fine, but where's the turkey? Uh, well, well... You did get the turkey. Uh, 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 look, instead, I, 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 I got this big, beautiful salami. Salami? A whole salami. Uh, uh, for Thanksgiving, but you told my father we'd have turkey. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm sorry I disappointed you, Betty. Oh, father will be so upset. He'll start insulting you the way he always does. Oh, uh, I shouldn't have bragged about the big turkey we were going to have. We should, we should have called the whole dinner off. My parents will be here any minute when my father sees the salami. Oh, gee, Betty, you, you've already set this beautiful table. Uh, yes, there's... The celery stalks, stuffed olives, candy yams, and all the fixins. And in the center, that big, beautiful, 15-pound salami. Oh, Mel, my father will be awfully mad. He's expecting turkey. Oh, well, oh I, I, I took care of that. I, I scooped out the center and stuffed it with chestnut dressing. Oh, and besides, Betty, what difference does it make? So, so salami or turkey? It's the spirit of Thanksgiving that counts. But, Mel... Besides, the orphan's home needed it much more than us. Is that what you did with it? Yes, Betty. Oh, I love you for giving that turkey to the orphan's home. You always were such a softie. If Father gets mad at you for not having the turkey... I'm going to tell him why. Oh, uh, I, I don't want you to tell your parents anything. I, I did it, uh, and I'm, I'm glad I did it, but uh, I don't need to advertise it. Oh, oh, that's the nicest thing I've ever heard. For that, I'm going to give you a nice big smooch. Oh, <laughs> there. Oh, oh su such a nice kiss for a 15-pound turkey. Yes. Gosh, I... 
I wish it had been 50 pounds. <laughs> oh, here they are, Mel. Hello! Oh, Mel. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, I can't wait to eat that turkey. Uh, hey, wait. Where's Mom? Oh, uh, she's at home in bed with laryngitis. <gasps> Oh, that, that, that's too bad. <laughs> Happiest Thanksgiving I've ever had. Father! <laughs> uh, uh, how, how's she feeling? <laughs> Darn that penicillin. Uh, uh, say, how, how did she get laryngitis? <laughs> Mel, we went to this football game and the little woman went completely berserk. Kept screaming her head off. Oh, she did? First opportunity she's ever had to yell at 22 people at once. Well, <laughs> happy Thanksgiving, children. Say, look at that table. When do we eat? I'm starving. Uh, well, I'll go to the kitchen and get the meat. <laughs> well, it smells good. Uh, hey, hey. Uh, did anyone uh, tell you you have a great sense of smell? I was telling the boys at lunch today about the big turkey we was having for dinner. Oh, uh, well, father... Don't call me father, son. From now on, you can call me dad. Oh, well, uh, dad. <laughs> um, did, did, did you have a big lunch? No, I just settled for a salami sandwich. Mel, can you come help me in the kitchen? Uh, 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 sh sh sure, Betty, be right there. Oh, Mel, I'm so nervous. Father's going to be so mad at you for having a salami instead of a turkey. I know. Why, why don't you just tell him you gave the turkey to the orphan's home? B B B Betty, th there's a reason I'm not saying anything. Because this year, your father forgot to give a turkey to the orphan's home himself. Oh, Mel. Such a good man. Oh, uh, thanks, Betty. Well, I... I guess we'd better go out and face the music. I have the salami right here on the platter. Oh, good, you're back. <laughs> I'll carve the turkey. I brought my own carving set. Now, place your order. What do you like? White meat? Drumstick? Oh, it just cut me six inches out of the middle. I guess you brought the carving knife for no reason. Oh, no, I didn't! No, oh, Father, no! Thanksgiving isn't Thanksgiving without turkey! I'll tell you, this is preposterous! Oh, everyone knows that salami is safer than turkey. Uh, no bones! Sure, Father. Can't we just make the best of it? At least we have something to eat for Thanksgiving. That's right, Betty. Well, Dad... How about a side of dark meat? Oh, says so, so silly me. <laughs> it all seems to be dark meat. This has gone too far. I'm not going to sit here and be made a fool of. And don't call me dad. Oh, Mel, I'm going to tell him why we haven't got the turkey. No. You got some nerve inviting people to a party and not even having a turkey. You ruined my whole holiday. Is Mr. Mel here? Uh, well, um, I, I, I'm here. Mr. Mel, I'm from the orphan's home. I brought you a piece of your turkey. Oh, <laughs> well, y you did? Yes, it tasted too good. All the boys wanted you to have some. Oh, 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 oh you. Oh. They wanted me to tell you how much they appreciated you remembering them on Thanksgiving Day. Oh, wow. Oh, gee, thanks. They also asked me to give you a message from all the boys at the orphanage. Mind if I give it? Uh, no, go, 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 go ahead. Two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? Mel Blank, Mel Blank, Mel Blank, hooray! Oh, thanks a lot. Happy Thanksgiving. So long, Mr. Mel. So long. Oh, gee. Wasn't that sweet? Oh, you gave your turkey to the orphanage? Father.
Father, he, he didn't want to tell you because you forgot to give your turkey this year. What? Oh, I told my assistant, that rotten scoundrel. Oh, 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 Father, I'm, I'm sure it was just an honest mistake. Well, meh, forget it. Let's forgive and let's eat. Sit next to me here, son. Oh, uh, y yes, sir. You can call me Dad. Oh, uh, 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 yes, Dad. Nah, there's nothing like the smell of salami on Thanksgiving. Oh, see, Betty, what difference does it make, salami or turkey? It's the spirit of Thanksgiving that counts. <laughs> On behalf of the actors and the Edmund Historical Society and the museum, we wish you a happy holiday cooking season. Hopefully, one that goes much smoother and includes all your favorite foods. If you enjoyed our old-time radio broadcast, please consider making a donation to our website or Facebook page so that we continue bringing you shows like this.